the part I love the best about these field reports is that guys will have horrible situations like a year in and then their problems that they can never figure out. You can always point to like the basic texts. What's going on guys? Mids watch episode again. I love this example because it comes up so often where guys, they run through their mail action plan, they run through their map, they read the red pill material, you know, Robert Glover, Manuel Smith, Rollo Tomasi, and then they get so far into their journey, about a year in to the point where you're having things like a main event, lots of tears, lots of crying, and then they forget that some of the basic, bare bones, boring stuff is exactly what they need in that situation. And it really shows you that the fundamentals will get you 99% of the where you want to be within your red pilled action plan. So this one is a guy, this one's eight years ago. This was an old one, old one. Anyways, the guy's name was uh, Snow Denied or Snow Dinned. I don't know, too many words. He was talking about how, uh, and I'll sum up the beginning part of it here. So he's gonna explain his father's funeral. Traveled for the funeral over the weekend. It was tough. I held frame for those who needed me. You know, a few times she expressed that they had she had doubts about our marriage and they were starting to creep in. And every time I remind her of several previous conversations, he's like, I'm not available for this right now. Something else is my attention. And he's like, it blew over mostly. So yeah, basically when he had the situation where his dad was dying and he had to be there for everybody and he's at his lowest moment, that's when she decides to come in with all these shit tests. And it's it's a feature, not a bug. I won't get into the details because it's not the point of this field report. He goes, tonight, I got home before her. I had just finished No More Mr. Nice Guy, Robert Glover's book, before making my own way home. Getting the kitchen, cleaning. She comes through the door in a terrible mood. We exchange pleasantries. Uh, she explains she doesn't feel good about us and doesn't want to go into details because she doesn't want to make it worse. And he goes, she always mentions this. He goes, I make an offer to listen. She says, no. He's like, all right, let me know if you change your mind. And then she leaves. Then it begins, an hour of crying, bawling, stomping, slamming, throwing phones and glasses, swearing, getting in his face, pushing him twice. He said, don't do it again or I'm calling the cops, which, again, that's not a solid strategy. I'll go over that in an episode later on. Absolutely in hysterics. He's a monster. She doesn't deserve him. Who knows? So it continued for a while. He tried to do like fogging green amplify as best he could, which again, it's not the right take, but it's a take. So he's like, he just went to the gym. He's like, I'm out. I can't, uh, this is it. Distance, S enforce a boundary, remove your attention, affection, commitment, going to the gym, an easy way, cools things down. Anyways, didn't really ask for anything out of that. For him, it was just more like, hey, thanks for listening kind of field reports. So it's not the most useful, but his field report came in three days later. And then to quickly sum it up, Wife had another explosion. This one had a massive nosebleed, which she saw fit to share by wiping blood on his shirt with her hands. And then she stormed off. And then she was crazy sexy in bed that night. Five days after, we had issues on the way. I told her I was leaving to go do something and over money, both were handled, although quite differently. I should mention in these, you probably have heard the episode where I talk about the three dysfunctional captains of uh of the of a failing marriage and this one is definitely a type two the captain with his constantly complaining passenger and like about this guy there's nothing like wrong with him he's perfectly normal on paper you'd look at him he's like why is he having these marriage problems there's nothing dysfunctional about him but it's like you know the chick is neurotic and crazy and here's the reason why it doesn't change because he gets that he gets something out of it he gets to be the guy that you know captain save a hoe basically and then when she gets super emotional on these highs, she gets emotional on the lows. The sex life is great. It's just every time he gets laid, it's basically at the tail end of like a murderous rampage of emotions. And for most guys are like, dude, it's not worth it. And that's kind of why he's here for these problems. So for him, started on a Saturday, huge explosion. He's almost dressed, goes to the living room. She's like, don't leave. He says, I'm going to the living room. And then she starts yelling. She says that I told her if she addresses me calmly and nicely, that I'll always listen. She says that because she just tried it and it didn't work, that means you lied. She gets irritated, cries, laughs hysterically, calls him a lot of names, goes back to the bedroom, slams the door in his face, then he hears a bang. He's like, I don't know what that is. So I open the door, she slams it right back in his face, but I catch a glimpse of blood on one of her hands. 
which is hiding or what she's holding near her face. And I could see she's having a huge nosebleed. He's like, yeah, she gets them from time to time. I'm like, all right, come here. You're bleeding. And then she's like, get away from me. She blows her nose in the bathroom, tries to slam the door. The faucet is going. She's crying and trying to yell at him through the door. He opens it. She yells again, stay away, you monster. And she accuses him of wanting a show. She's like, do you want an even better one? Here. She lunges at him, wipes blood all over his shirt. Then the shower starts. I don't know why she decided, like, I just freaked out, so I better have a shower. <laughs> so she comes out soaking wet, wearing the clothes. Like, she went with her clothes into the shower. The sink and floor covered in the blood. He's like, Jesus, this is dramatic. Goes back to the bedroom. There's more crying. You know what? There's, like, a lot of details. But I think at this point, you understand what he's dealing with. Like, it's absolute neurotic insanity all the time. Now, the problem is it's only a snapshot. There's probably a lot of buildup to this. A lot of, uh... things that would help you break the situation away but that's not here nor there and i actually like how they don't exist here because from a red pill perspective it's good to start with the snapshot how do you deal with this situation as it is because most guys will just tell you and this is why i my favorite part of this channel is how guys are like i used to watch all these guys in the manosphere and all this red pill content but now i only watch yours and you want to know why this is why do you really want to hear a 45 minute breakdown of how this girl became a neurotic mess or do you want to find out what kind of tools within the red pill work to get you out of this situation and into something much more pleasant? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question for you guys. So he does more talking, more topping, and he has to explain it's definitely talking in a calm way. And it's one of those things where it's like, when they tell you I said something rationally and calmly, I guarantee you, if you go see their body language, they are tense as fuck. So I always make an effort to remember that. Every time somebody makes an effort to remind how calm he is, know that he's not calm at all. So I skipped about a page and a half, two pages worth of blabber. He's like, all right, so when we're done, we laid there talking for a while. Then I said, I'm leaving to take care of my plans. She asked where they were. I said, if I thought she needed to know, I'd tell her. I pointed out that we're a team and she knows how to reach me on the phone if she needs me, but where I was going was not her concern. He gave her a list of chores, said which ones he would handle when he got back, and she's fine with all that. Yay. Sunday, wakes up. She was anxious about the things getting better. He said, trust me. Let her talk. Sizable issue came up on Sunday. On the way to the restaurant for dinner, I decided to bring up a large purchase I'm planning on making in the year. Now recall from one of his early posts, he kept his finance separate, which is smart. Always keep your finances separate, and we can get into that. That's a whole later episode. Or if you're watching this live, I'll probably chit-chat about it in between episodes. But So that situation comes up. Pleasant Air goes away, and then he's getting griefed for the consulting on her plan, and a whole other fight starts up. So as you can see, it's like a fairly good theme. Things are calm. Things are quiet. Things are rational. Any situation comes up, she makes it about trust issues, has a blow-up, and then he has to do a lot of crisis management. And then usually at the tail end of it comes into sex. There's three more of these things, so I won't waste your time here. What I'm going to show you is our breakdown and his attempt to see where his problems are. So in his case, positives. All right. I held frame since the blow up. I showed that immature behavior is not going to have the same effect that it once did. He's not going to come running for everything and be, you know, save a hoe on this one. He used sex to show alpha traits. It's not true, but he's getting there. Uh, I have her sign of what she wanted. I have the ears. I controlled my emotions. I respond instead of reacting. I'm getting more and more comfortable taking charge. You know, on Sunday, although I lost frame, I did manage to speak my mind clearly and then move on. Again, this is very blue-pilled blue -pilled goals. Like, being able to communicate better is not the point here, but it's fine. His negatives, he's like, I still talk too much. I just talk way too much. I also need time to get used to giving her the things I don't need, like emotional attention and that. He goes again on Sunday, I lost frame and went verbally ballistic, and I'm still hoping that this is worth it. I don't think I can rationalize it, so. We know that these videos really prey on vulnerable young men who have not had many experiences in dating. This is going to be a bit of a burger breakdown. Jack goes into why when I say no, I feel guilty is such a good work. Before we start there though, I just want to point out there's uh, attachment styles. 
if you guys have heard about this before, I'm sure some chicks have talked about it because it's like a pop science sort of psych thing where the way and the way they reference it is how kids act around strangers. You know, some kids are very friendly. They walk up, say hi. Some kids are very shy and they won't say anything. And they had uh, the so the, the the four different attachment styles. The one that matters here is anxious avoidant, which is basically every time you see like one of these crazy fly up the handles, accuse the guy of always cheating with him kind of stuff, and is basically a neurotic mess. That's what you're getting into. And so a lot of red pill guys for a time there grasp onto this attachment theory because it explained why their wife was crazy so often, and then. They could figure out plans to desensitize her to her neuroticism and all this. And it was just like, it's missing the point. It's like, why are you going through so much effort to break somebody who has no intention of fixing themselves? But aside from that, back to this one. Jack's like, you know what? For what it's worth, I think you'd be getting more out of When I Say No, I Feel Guilty from Manuel Smith than Married Man Sex Life Primer from... Anyways, your wife's a very emotionally needy woman who doesn't hesitate to make you feel bad when you take don't take responsibility for her feelings. The easiest way to handle these situations are techniques like fogging, negative assertion, and negative inquiry. Uh, quickly, if you don't know what those are, fogging is a way of acknowledging somebody's emotions. Girls usually speak and process their emotions by speaking, but you don't validate them. So once you validate them, you make them real. So in her case, you know, I'm freaking out. Why would you do that? And you're like, I can see why you'd say that. You see what I mean? It's a very, it's a very good statement at not making her feel invalidated, but at the same time not validating the statement. Negative assertion and negative inquiry is more so when they come at you with an attack. Like, why would you say that? What makes you think this? And you basically respond back as a question on the negative to get them to explain it, in the hopes that they have a fairly irrational take, and that a negative inquiry will allow them to articulate it, which makes them realize that it's kind of goofy. Anyways, go go to the books, go through the sidebar. I talk about it all there. Uh, he brings up the quote where the guy's like, his wife says that if I just, she just addresses you calmly and nicely that I'll always listen. She says that because you tried it, didn't work. He must have lied to her. And he's like, you know what? Fogging and negative inquiry would be the perfect response here. Respond with questions like, so you felt that you addressed me calmly? Or what bothered you about me leaving the room? You know, every version of every argument you have is with her saying, I feel bad and it's your fault. And the right response is, it's not my fault, but I acknowledge you feel bad. Again, classic fogging. If she replies maturely, this will segue into a comfort test. And if not, this is where he brings up all the times where she was laughing hysterically and crying and nose bleeding and that. He's like, I said in my reply last time to you, your new rule is you're not going to be responsible for her emotions. You'll told her you'll engage with her emotions if she puts some effort into not losing her shit. And her response here is basically, well, I did what you said, and you didn't keep your end of the bargain, so now I'm going back to the old system. And obviously, that's bullshit. If you have kids that are preteen or teen, you'll probably recognize this technique. As a parent, you're often juggling between giving your kids freedom and responsibility. Sometimes you give them too much freedom and realize now you need to attach to it some responsibility. I'll give you an example with my oldest son. Just got his driver's license last year. I let him borrow my car and he'd basically trash the interior and the exterior. So next time I told him, new rule, you can borrow my car, but you got to get it washed once a week. He's not happy. It was a lot easier having the freedom to drive my car without the responsibility for its cleanliness. So the next week he wiped a sponge with no soap in the car for 10 seconds and said, see, I washed it. And I'm like, no, that's bullshit. And the kid flipped out. He didn't like the new system, but he thought if he could find some inconsistency in the system, and then he can get it thrown out and go back to the old system. I would recommend you don't let your wife succeed at doing this. I should almost make a whole video on just this part here where guys will... It's actually funny because a lot of wives bitch about their husbands doing this. They call it um, weaponized incompetence. Where somebody, and I, I maybe it has some merit, maybe it doesn't, but in this case, yeah, wives all the time. Where as a husband, you start to set your boundaries, you start to set your rules. She looks for an inconsistency. She does what I reference in my article on the different types of manipulation, frame shifting. Point out an inconsistency, point out a hypocrisy, point out a technicality, and then hoping that the guy feels bad. It's like, all right, fine, we'll go back to the old way. That's That's really all this is. Anywho. He brings up 
how he treats his wife as a child has been for a long time. Months before his father died, back in the field reported really earlier. She's like, I've been avoiding her problem and doing nothing for it. She says it's just worse now. We're like, well, it should be telling that I compared your wife's behavior to using an anecdote of my child. Throughout all your posts, I can't even figure out why she loses her shit. By the way, he's got about 10 of these. It's been a, it's been a long road. So what problems is she claiming that she's having that you're not helping with? She explained the one thing that she will always need above all else is for me to take care of her feelings and emotions, even if I don't need her to do the same. He's like, try this. You can Google examples of fogging or negative inquiry or negative assertion without reading all of when I say no, I feel guilty. So do that. Next time she gets upset, try those techniques. When she escalates into a nuclear shit test mode, just leave. I mean, wiping blood on your shirt, what the fuck? Dude, stop dealing with the hysterics and the verbal abuse. I suspect you endure them because your wife has some pretty full-blown cluster B traits and you're legitimately worried that if you were to actually leave the house while she's in hysterics, she'd get even more hysterical, slit her wrists or torture house or something. Well, if that's the case, I don't, and I know this isn't easy to say, but you need to call her bluff. Your wife has literally internalized that if you act or react and I feel bad, then it's your fault. And even worse, she knows that there is a level of DEFCON 1 nuclear shit test that will always work. And I don't think it gets better until you can show her it doesn't work. This will be your main event. She'll either get with the program or you'll leave and come back to your house set on fire. Now, obviously that's going to be awful, but think about how you're living right now. My wife gets to blame me for anything that makes her feel bad, and I can only resist to a certain point before I need to worry about her torching the house. So you may lose your marriage if you do this. She may decide that if she really can't be married to you where you take responsibility for her emotions, she doesn't want to be married to you at all. And I know you're here because you're trying to do everything you can to save your marriage, but it will be impossible to save as long as she thinks there's an option to play DEFCON 1 nuclear shit test anytime she wants. Uh, he brings up the quote where the guy's like, yeah, we argued over my choice of words. I'm going to the gym now. Then I comforted her. In retrospect, I didn't handle it quite how I wanted to. It's like, there should not have been an argument. Your wife is apparently someone who can be upset by the simplest declarative future tense statements. I am going to the gym. I am going to buy this. Okay, well, we do call married red pill hard mode for a reason. For these simple statements, stick to agree and amplify. In this example, you could have tied it back to your promise to have sex. I need to get pumped so I can throw you over my shoulder and haul you upstairs to the bedroom later. You know, whatever. And he brings up the last point where the guy was driving. They're having a normal conversation. Then, like, all of a sudden, as soon as something comes up, it becomes a full-blown meltdown in the car. He's like, fogging and negative assertion and inquiry work here. She's upset, probably because she's hamstering that this financial decision is going to lead to a slippery slope of huge financial decisions that you'll have no input on, and then you'll either bankrupt the family or leave her penniless. And clearly that's ridiculous. The beauty of fogging is that you can acknowledge those feelings without ent entertaining the idea that they are not ridiculous. Uh, last quote, he's like, at one point, if you said, uh, at one point he said, if you don't want me and you want a wife instead, then I'm gone. And she responded, I do what I do want you. And then we went to dinner during which I maintained an air of that never happened. And we enjoy ourselves. He's like, look, there's some redeeming points here. Your wife does want to have sex with you even better. Sex with you is comforting to her. Lastly, while it wasn't great that you lost your cool, she could have responded by going to DEFCON 1, but she didn't. So your path going forward is simple. One, your wife will continue losing her shit over things like simple declarative statements. Your goal is to acknowledge your feelings without acknowledging that they're rational, justified, or in any way your fault. The better you get at techniques like fogging, the easier it'll be. Two, you will probably not be perfect at this, and you will cause her to escalate into DEFCON 1 more often. There's nothing to be gained by enduring a torrent of physical abuse or verbal abuse. Just leave. She may do something severe. She probably won't, though. And three, keep working on you. Increase your value. Don't lose sight of this, because this is how you ultimately end all the tests. Once she feels there's a competent, confident captain at the helm, she'll have no reason to hamster about things like financial decisions. Now, uh, my thoughts on this one, I'm going to back off on part three because generally speaking, that's not the case. This is one of those cases where you're going to have a main event and she goes submissive. And I do find the assertiveness stuff here. The one and two are super important. 
mostly because there's a third way these things get handled and it's not healthy. Jack kind of picked it up and I picked it up too. They have these big fights and then when he loses his shit, you would expect that she would escalate it further like he does when he tries to calm her down. In this case, no. When he loses his shit and becomes a rageaholic, she calms the fuck down. They have good sex, calms down. What would most guys take from that, you know, A-B testing of your life? They take it like, oh, well, I'm not an abuser, but I got to play one on TV. This is, uh, I would call it the pathological version of what I refer to as manufactured outrage, where, you know, girls like drama in their lives. So every now and then you pick a random fight for no reason and then end it because you don't care about it. And it's nice. It gets... It gets the theater out of the way, keeps things exciting. If you're really good at it, it's kind of just one of those naturally things you do anyway because you have strong boundaries and that just pisses people off when they want you to do what they want you to do, right? But if you ramp that up to 12, you get situations like this. Again, I've had friends that do this. This situation is horrible because the girl has played herself up as this neurotic victim, you as the complete overbearing asshole, and at the same time, now, I don't want you hanging around with your friends. I feel sick. You got to hang out with me. I've lost friends to this shit. So, like, it's real to me. And again, super complex problems. Super crazy neurotic woman. Was she always like this? Did it just happen recently? I don't know. But I do know this. Once you can get through, when I say no, I feel guilty. You basically have all the tools you need to manage these things. And I don't mean manage these things as, like, if I use this tool, she'll calm the fuck down. No, it's manage these things and if I use these tools... I won't turn into a blubbering idiot that ends up being codependent on a wife that can't stand me and wipes blood on my shirt. And I think at this point, that's all you can hope for. Work on yourself, do the third part, the male action plan, build your value, build your options, build your abundance. Then a year from now, you can look back and go, do I really need this in my life? Can I replace this thing in my life? And will I be happier when I do? And you'll have, for better or for worse, a solid answer for all of them. So take care, guys. I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.